Thank you, and good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to spend my time with you this afternoon talking about climate change, and I hope tell you two things that you may not know about climate change. I think we have a fairly common understanding of what's going on with climate change. We burn fossil fuels, the carbon dioxide goes up into the air, it increases the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, that warms things up on the planet, and we have a cooling system on the planet called the ocean. And the oceans have absorbed more than 90% of the climate change heat that we've added to the planet at a rate of better than a Hiroshima atom bomb per second. So they're warming up. And when things warm, they expand. So that takes me to the first thing that we have to look at, which is our home state of Rhode Island. This is Rhode Island 240 years ago. And if you went back another 240 years from the Narragansetts and the Wampanoags were here, it would have looked just about the same. The map of Rhode Island is very distinctive. If you look carefully at my Wilsons of Wickford tie, you can see the outline of uh, the map of Rhode Island on it right now. So let's take a look up close at the northern part of Narragansett Bay. You'll see uh, Warwick to our right, and if you look closely, you can see the airport to the far right, and then you see the river going up into Providence, which is at the top of the map, and then down uh, is Warren and Bristol on the left. And as I said, that's kind of what the state, that part of the map has looked like for century after century after century. Well, because of sea level rise, NOAA and our Coastal Resources Management Council and our University of Rhode Island have gotten really good at predicting what is going to happen in this century. And this is their prediction for the end of the century. Everything that is blue on that map was land and is now water. So if you look at Warwick Neck, you see that Warwick Neck is now Warwick Neck Island. And you go across to that big blue area, that's now Barrington. Barrington becomes Lake Barrington, I guess. Down here in Warren and Bristol, you can see how Papasquash has now gone and has broken up into a number of islands. Rhode Island has become a new archipelago. By the end of the century, something a girl born today at Women and Infants will see in her lifetime. If you move south down the bay, you get to Newport on the right and Jamestown on the left, and you can see that there are similar changes that we are to expect in that part of our state as well. There's the change. Jamestown becomes not one island, but three. And as you'll see where the bridge connects, Newport to Jamestown, you have to go through water to get to the bridge. So you'll need a bridge to get to the Newport Bridge on Jamestown. Newport itself, the western end of Newport, breaks off entirely, becomes a new island. Off of that is Little Castle Hill Island, a new island on the new island. And across our coasts, this is the type of change that we are now told to expect. Go up to Providence, and this was what was expected for Providence before the latest NOAA estimates add, added 20 inches to their estimate of global sea level rise. Before. Under the latest estimates, this is what downtown Providence comes to look like. And if you close in on City Hall, you see that that gondola ride may be something that you need and it will take you right to the top of the stairs at City Hall. And then you can come on in. 
And whether this becomes more like Venice or whether they have to abandon it, it's a very significant problem. Or do we do Holland and build dikes around Providence? So that's the first point. This is going to hit home in Rhode Island in amazingly consequential and new ways. The second is, what the hell is going on where I come from in Congress about this? And why is so little going on? Well, when I got to the Senate, it was 2007. And in the years that I was first there, 2007, 2008, and 2009, every single one of these Republican senators was on a climate change bill. We had a robust conversation. We had a lot of energy. We had bipartisan hearings, bipartisan bills. We didn't get anything completed, but we were on the path to good legislation the way you'd expect Congress to take on a big issue. And then it came to a shuddering halt. What happened? What happened was a decision of the United States Supreme Court called Citizens United. And from that moment forward, things changed. Citizens United allowed the biggest special interests in the country, including the fossil fuel industry, to spend unlimited amounts of money in politics. And money in politics looks a little bit different than just money. It looks like political weaponry. And here's a picture of a Soviet May Day parade weaponry display. In a similar way, the fossil fuel industry rolled out 501c4s and super PACs and shell corporations and front groups. And they even created a group called Donors Trust, whose whole purpose is to hide the identity of a donor who wants to make contributions into the system. The effect of that was basically this. If you could imagine an echocardiogram ticking away with good work happening with all those six bipartisan senators, and then after January of 2010, after that decision, flatline. Not one Republican senator has been willing to sign on to one significant piece of carbon dioxide reduction legislation. These are some of the groups that make that possible. They not only help support that political effort, the weaponry that is directed and the threats behind the weaponry that is directed at our political process, but they also propagate the phony science of climate denial. We're all hearing a lot these days about fake news. Folks, climate denial was the original fake news. And many of the people who propagated that original climate denial fake news have now moved into the larger business of fake news more generally. Now, those aren't just individual institutions. They're connected. This is a graphic done by a professor named Robert Brule at Drexel University who's made it his academic field of study to figure out how this all works to follow the money and draw the diagram and show the network. And as you can see, this looks rather like a web. One of the things we're learning is that there are defectors from this web who are beginning to tell their story about what goes on inside of it. One was reported in the Washington Post recently. This was a person who said they had to remain anonymous for fear of retaliation. But what they said to the Washington Post reporter was, there's a whole web of organizations out there who are designed to do this, and their purpose is to create a cacophony of voices so it doesn't sound like it's all coming from one place and not just the fossil fuel industry itself through all those different front groups. And another one came out, his name is Jerry Taylor. I've gotten to know Jerry. He's a very brave and very intelligent and very conservative person. He used to be the number two person at the Cato Institute, one of those groups, and he was their lead on climate denial. And he learned two things while he was working for the Cato Institute. The first was he discovered, to use his words, that a lot of the scientific narratives that I was offering were really dodgy. And as a professional and as an honest man, that made him increasingly anxious. 
And he found out also that on the economic side, you could not find an academic economist who studies climate change who argued against climate action. Not one single one. He has said this publicly, and he started his own institute to work on conservative solutions to climate change. But it shows what we're up against. Now, on our side, we've got some pretty cool people. I love Pope Francis. He wrote an entire encyclical about climate change, and it was one of the most moving documents I've ever read. Just last week, he said, we all have a responsibility here, all of us, small or large, a moral responsibility, and we have to take it seriously. History will judge the decisions. So I press on as best I can, taking my little time to wake up sign to the Senate floor every week. It's getting increasingly dog-eared and beat up as I pass through my 180th speech. But you cannot stop science and facts. And increasingly, my colleagues are getting more and more anxious about being held down by that web of climate denial and political threat. And I really want you to know that this is not partisanship in Washington. The fossil fuel industry has done a very good job of going after only Republicans to beat them into submission, to make it look like it's partisan. But you remember those faces from 2007, 2008, 2009, many of them are still there. John McCain campaigned for president on the Republican ticket with a terrific climate platform. This is old-fashioned, special interest, special pleading, the kind of thing that legislatures have seen for years, but with the new extraordinary May Day parade of political artillery backing it up that Citizens United unleashed. So we can change that. This is not something that is doomed to the partisan wars of Washington. We can change this. And with any luck, in the months ahead, you will see a dramatic change. Thank you for giving me this chance to share these thoughts with you.